Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this service of thanksgiving for the life of Harold Stewart. This morning, we led Harold's body to rest up at Roselawn, and now we take this time to give thanks to God for his life. We take this time to hear of the hope that was Harold's, for Harold was a Christian, and for him, death is not the end, it's not a tragedy, for Harold to die is gain. Harold loved his family. He was a husband to Beth, who went ahead of him to her eternal home about five years ago. He was a father to Joanne and father-in-law to David, a grandfather to Gareth and Jonathan and grandfather-in-law to Rachel. As well as loving his family, his biological family, Harold also loved his great Vic family. He was a member of this church for over 50 years. He served as a church deacon for 28 years, treasurer for 27 years, Sunday school superintendent for 13 years, and was a church trustee for 32 years, right up to the time of his death. Many of you who knew Harold well would know that he had a wonderful blend of a good sense of humor mixed with a real practical godliness. That was an encouragement to many people. Scripture was in his bloodstream, and there was a contentment about Harold that you couldn't miss. He had a peaceful demeanor. And that peaceful demeanor reflected the peace that he had in his soul because of his hope in Jesus Christ. Harold will be missed by us all as a fellowship, but we know will be missed most by you who are closest, have been closest to him. And so on behalf of my wife, Lindsay, and I, and our whole church fellowship at Great Vic, we wish you all as a family our deepest sympathy and love. We grieve today, but not as those who do not have hope. For though Harold is absent from his body that was led to rest this morning, he is now present with the Lord and more alive than ever. At a real time of grief, the author of the book of Lamentations wrote of his hope in the Lord. And I want us to open with these words. Lamentations 3 verse 21 Though my soul remembers my affliction and is bowed down within me, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Harold was a man who could look back over his life and say those words, great is thy faithfulness. And those are going to be the words that we sing now together. So if I can invite you to stand, if you're able, please, let's sing together this opening hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Now the Reverend David Reed is going to come and lead us in prayer, and Harold's grandson Gareth will come after that to read us, uh, read to us from the scriptures. Thank you. Writing to the Christian church in Thessalonica, the Apostle Paul says that we do not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. And we know today, as Pastor Ald has already said, that Harold has gone on to be with the Lord. He is in a much better place. And he has proved the scripture that says that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's bow in God's presence as we pray together. Let us all pray. Our Father God, we bow before you now in worship and in praise. We come to acknowledge that you are the living, the true God. You are God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we want to thank you today, Lord, for your great faithfulness. We've just sung those ancient words, that lovely hymn. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. And we thank you, Lord, that in a world that is constantly changing, we can rely on you, the Lord God Almighty, who does not change. We thank you, Father God, for every blessing that you give us in our lives. Lord, you make daily provision for all of our needs. Forgive us that so often, Lord, we just take from you. And in fact, Lord, we actually take you for granted. Give us hearts that are truly thankful. Father, we thank you today for the joy of human love. We thank you, Lord, that you place us together in families. You put us alongside friends. And yes, Lord, we know that when we lose someone, the love that we have for them makes that loss all the more poignant and all the more difficult. And so today, Lord, we come to pray for those who mourn Harold's passing, for Joanne and David, for Gareth and Rachel, for Jonathan, for all those who knew and loved Harold. We want to thank you today, Lord, for the man that he was, we want to thank you, Lord God, for his sense of fun, for his friendship, for the wise counsel that he gave to many. We thank you, Lord God, most of all for his faith in Jesus as his Lord and as his Savior, because that's our confidence today, Lord. That's our hope. That's how we can come to this service of thanksgiving and give thanks for a great victory. Lord, Harold has shared in the victory of Jesus, that victory over death. And even now he is at your right hand, and he is there, Lord, watching and worshiping and waiting around your throne. He has looked into the lovely face of Jesus and heard those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And so today we give you thanks, Lord, that Harold has completed his earthly journey and that now he is safe in the arms of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for Harold's love for this place, for this fellowship here in Great Victoria Street, for all the ways, Lord, that he served you here, for the burden that he had, particularly for the young people and the children, to see them come to Jesus. And we know, Lord, that the heritage that, that he has left here will last for, for many years. Today, Lord, we want to thank you for Jesus. We want to thank you for our Savior, for his death and resurrection, for the forgiveness of our sins. As we remember that the Bible tells us that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For the confidence that in Christ there is that great sure and certain hope of heaven. 
for all who believe in him. And so, Lord, we do not grieve today as those who have no hope. We grieve, Lord, a loss. We grieve because of someone who we will miss. But we thank you for the hope that Harold had, the hope that each of us can have in Jesus. And that certainty, Lord, that in Christ one day we will be reunited around your great throne in heaven. And we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Our first reading uh, today is found in John 14, verses 1 to 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that, I, that where I am, you may be also. And you, know, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our second reading is found in, in Romans 8, uh, verses 31 to 39, God's everlasting love. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring, us, who shall bring against us a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, and who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks for that, David and Gareth. Uh, now, Harold's daughter Joanne, or <laughs> daughter Joanne, yes, nearly said that wrong, is going to come and pay tribute to her father. Thanks, Joanne. Joseph Harold Stewart, my dad, was born on the 22nd of June 1938 in 97 Lupland Park, Belfast the house that would remain his home until he got married. He was the only child of his parents, James and Annie. By the way, I feel I've already let my dad down in this tribute, as his style when he was speaking up here was to start with a joke or two. My grand and granny Stuart owned a green grocer's shop in the Bearsbridge Road, so much of dad's childhood was spent in the shop. He told stories of how he and his lifelong friend, Leonard Hill, played in the back of the shop. On one occasion, Dad pelted Leonard, with a, pelted Leonard with a tomato, which hit him in the face. And I understand Len refused to eat tomatoes at all for about 10 years. And even now, probably nearly 80 years later, he still only eats them reluctantly. Early school days for Dad were at Elm Grove Primary. He recounted how from time to time the principal would send for him and he would get a Harold, does your father have any bananas or some other fruit in the shop? And if the answer was yes, he would be sent straight away to go and bring back the requested item. I'm not sure that school principals would get away with that these days. Dad loves, loved to tell stories about his early life, his special gas mask because he was so young, 
the air raid shelter, removing the railings at the front of the house to make weapons in the war, and on the stories went. These stories were repeated over and over again, often with a, have I mentioned that before? Yes, just a few times. One such story began with, have I told you about my first trip across the Atlantic? He would then go on to tell us again how he and his mum had gone by boat to New York when he was 10 to visit his aunt and her family. Quite a trip in 1948. Even though, though this must have been a great experience, the highlight for 10-year-old Harold was that in New York, you could get sweets without coupons. Apparently, sweets were still rationed here at that time. When Elm Grove days were over, Dad moved to Grosvenor Grammar School, which at that time was located, as the name suggests, on the Grosvenor Road. In fact, Dad frequently reminded me when we were returning to the car park after appointments in the Royal, that the car park was where he used to play rugby at school. He enjoyed rugby, but was quick to point out that his four caps for the first 15 were only because they were really stuck. Towards the end of his school days, Dad was struggling to work out what he would do next. Over the last few weeks, at the time of the death of his cousin Anne, he talked with great gratitude about her help, how, how helpful her father, Dad's uncle John, had been at that time in suggesting he went into the bank and then helping him with the application process. So he successfully completed the entrance exam for what was then the Belfast Bank and began work there. After a spell working in Belfast, he was transferred to work in Rathfra Island. Before going to Rathfra Island, Dad had suggested to his mum and dad that he would need transport and was planning to buy a motorbike. Smart move. Grand and Granny were never going to entertain that. So gave him the extra needed to buy a Morris Minor, his pride and joy. In Rathfra Island, he stayed with a family who kept boarders. There was a young teacher in the same digs who had no means of getting from Belfast to Rathfra Island on a Sunday evening. So dad was asked if he would mind giving her a lift. He recalled not being particularly happy with this idea and also recalled how she talked a lot in the car. <laughs> however, however, over time, he clearly began, became used to the talking as he later married that young teacher, Beth Conley. Dad was later transferred to the bank in County Armagh. Mum and Dad were married on the 25th of March 1964 and began married life in Armagh. In May 1966, I arrived, or as Dad suggested when he and I were discussing the tribute for Mum's funeral, in May 1966, life was wrecked. <laughs> dad was transferred back to Belfast two years later and we moved into Beechgrove Avenue where Mum and Dad remained. Dad had a long career in the Belfast and then Northern Banks. Then nearly 30 years ago, he got a package and took early retirement. He used to joke about how cross the bank must be that after all these years, he was still drawing the pension. Dad had been brought up in another Baptist church in Belfast, but told how as he grew up, he used to love to escape from there on a Sunday night and come here to Great Vic. This wasn't always with Granny's blessing. So one significant part of the move back to Belfast from Armagh was joining Great Victoria Street Baptist Church in October 1971. Dad loved this church and in recent days was so pleased to see so many new young folk coming and joining us. They're the future, he would say. Over the years, as Steve has already mentioned, he has carried out various duties in this place, League of Church Loyalty Secretary, minibus driver, deacon and trustee. He was involved in Sunday school as a teacher, treasurer, and then at 13 years as Sunday school superintendent. He retained an interest in the work with children in the surrounding area all his life. However, I guess he will be most remembered for his 20 year stint as church treasurer. Everything that dad did in this church had to be done to the very best of his ability. All I's had to be dotted and all T's crossed. As soon as the end of the financial year was reached, he wouldn't relax until the books were with the auditor so that the financial report could be produced in a timely manner. It has to be said that on one particular occasion, I recall his enthusiasm had to be curbed. It was New Year's Eve and mum and dad were invited out. Dad's initial response was that he couldn't go because the church books had to be started. 
It took quite a bit of persuasion to convince them that realistically it was only the 31st of December and one night wasn't going to make a whole heap of difference. So they went out. He took his financial reporting at business meetings very seriously. However, these always started with a joke or two, told with a totally dead pan expression. He used to say, start with a joke and it puts the congregation in a good mood for any bad news that's to follow. <laughs> However, Dad was very quick to acknowledge the help he got as treasurer from the two auditors during his time, the late Jack Alexander and Tom Adair. He would say, I do the easy bit, they do the hard bit. Why was Dad so keen to do a good job as treasurer and in all the other roles he fulfilled? His motivation was to serve Christ, who has a young boy he had asked into his life to be his saviour and his guide. Dad loved Port Stewart. He continued to use the caravan until the end of May this year. He enjoyed walking the Strand, wee runs to Ballycastle, Limavady, etc. His fish and chips, fry, or when I complained, the healthy option of prawn salad and Morelli's, with a large cappuccino, of course. Pretty much every time he was asked at a hospital appointment how he was, his response was the same. Well, I can still walk the length of Port Stewart Strand. That was the yardstick by which his health was measured. And of course, all those walks in Port Stewart Strand and everywhere else were completed with a cap firmly positioned on his head. Dad loved watching sport, particularly rugby and cricket. Mum and Dad loved going to London and when they went during the summer, Dad was always keen to get tickets to, to go to the cricket at Lord's or the Oval. He used to joke that he would, in his, in his own words, walk the feet off Beth round the shops the day before and then she was happy to sit and watch the cricket for a day. <laughs> Dad loved to study the Bible. Right to the end, he was keen to learn more from the Word of God. He loved to listen to people preaching from the Bible. He was sufficiently familiar with it that he could accurately recite large chunks. It was clear that even over recent weeks when he was struggling with his short-term memory, his ability to quote scripture remained. Probably a lesson there for all of us. Dad loved his, us, his family. Gareth and Jonathan are clearly very different and yet he related to both so well and so appropriately. Gareth and Dad shared the same unfortunate sense of humour. Our good friend, Eric Lindsay, who went to be with the Lord several years ago, once said, as long as there's breath in Gareth McKillen, Harold Stewart's sense of humour will live on. Sorry about that. <laughs> Gareth said the other day, there's no one left to laugh at my jokes now. Dad enjoyed participating in games when the boys were young, although Gareth recalls that relationships did become strained one day when they were playing the war. And Dad was hiding in the pop-up tent and Gareth mounted a gas attack spraying the bathroom air conditioner in his grandest face. One thing Rachel, Gareth's wife, maybe isn't particularly thankful for is that Gareth impart imparted his love of documentaries to Gareth. The War, Fred Dibna, Michael Palin, Great British Railways, and so the list goes on. Gareth had commented on the calming influence of his grandest Stuart. He recalls just over a year ago on the day that Grandma McKillen died, when David also ended up in hospital with heart problems, that one of his first suggestions was, we need Grandis Stuart down here. In Gareth's words, he was good at steadying the ship. Jonathan used to complain, Grand is annoying me, when in reality, Granda was nowhere near him. And that really meant, Granda, I want you to come and poke and tickle and annoy me. They had good fun together. In recent times, Jonathan renamed his Granda Softy. I think that gives a fair indication of their relationship. Latterly, when the two were left together, it was debatable who had the most sense and who was looking after who. <laughs> As a dad, he was always there with good, solid advice. I remember his first question when I, when I was offered my first job was, is there a pension scheme? That didn't concern me much at that stage, but I can certainly see the importance of it now. More importantly, he was always behind me and many others in prayer. He knew that the most important factor in any decision making and in general everyday life was that God's will for our lives was followed. Mum and Dad had a very happy life together. Their policy, particularly during retirement, was to get the car out, go for a wee run, and hit the local and not so local coffee shops, affectionately known by her grandsons as the Granny Circuit. 
Dad's life changed forever in February 2018 when he lost mum. To say that he had been well looked after for 54 years is an understatement. To say that pretty much everything was done for him was not an exaggeration. And yet he stepped up, learning how to use the washing machine, the tumble dryer and even the iron. I remember his total amazement when I showed him how to remove the fluff from the tumble dryer. I got one of his favourite phrases, powerful altogether, and then, did Net Beth know about this? I assured him that she would have done. Although Dad desperately missed Mum, and although life had changed so much, he was determined to make the most of it. He said at one stage, the first time I went back into the house after Mum died, I thought to myself, this is the way it is now. I just need to get on with it and make the most of it. And he did. On the first anniversary of Mum's death, when we were putting flowers on her grave, I said to him, you've been so good, you've never complained. And he said, two things. I have many good, happy memories. And I have the Lord with me to help me. I couldn't do it without him. And with the strength given to him, he continued to make the most of his life. He enjoyed going to Newton Arts to Knott's Bakery, to Donegal Dee for a cappuccino and an apple strudel, followed by a walk, and then fish and chips at the chippy, to Kalinchi for a walk and a cappuccino. Seriously, though, I believe his efforts to get himself out and about really helped to keep up his positive attitude. Even if it was just down to forest side for a bacon bap and, of course, a cappuccino. You've got to wonder if all these coffee shops are going to survive the downturn in business <laughs> now. Dad, Mum and Dad's good friends, George and Elsie Gibson, aren't able to be with us today. But I want to thank them um, because until COVID and ill health prevented them, they travelled nearly every week from Coke to Belfast in winter or Coke to Port Stewart in summer to spend time with Dad. I really think George went above and beyond the required duties of a best man. I've been amazed at how many times in recent weeks someone has des described Dad as a gentleman. From people who knew him well to those who didn't know him so well, even nurses and doctors who experienced him in his weakest days, but I guess he was a gentleman and right to the very end was ever grateful for anything anyone ever did to help him. There are so many other things you'll be thankful to know that, about Dad that I don't have time to go into in detail. His love of James Bond movies, of watching Morse, his trips to, McDonald, his trips to McDonald's at Brackenfield, where because he didn't really know what he wanted, he would just point to the big picture of whatever the special was and say, one of those, please. There were his sayings regarding money, you can't take it with you. When we were going out, let us away today, today. When things weren't great, it came to pass. I am thankful that the weakness and frailty, the heart, lungs and memory problems came and have now passed. Dad trusted Jesus as his saviour as a boy of 12. He looked forward to spending eternity with his saviour in heaven. He had no fear of death. We had a conversation last week where he said he wanted to go home. I said, home Beach Grove Avenue? And he said, yes. I said, what about home to heaven? And he replied in his weakness, that would be better still. I ended my tribute at mum's funeral with this quote from the great American evangelist, Billy Graham. Someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? I shall be more alive than I am now. I will just have changed my address. I have gone into the presence of God. Dad and mum are more alive today than ever before. They have changed address and are reunited in the presence of God. They lived for Christ, now they are with Christ. Thanks so much, Joanne, for that wonderful tribute. That was just brilliant. Uh, and that is the Harold that I think many of you knew more than I did. I've only got to enjoy him over the last five years, but that is the Harold we knew. And I'd heard all of those one-liners, uh, and I heard the story about him being caught in McDonald's with his cappuccino and chips and everything, so just wonderful. 
Well, we're going to stand again uh, before we reflect on God's word to sing the words of this lovely hymn, I Will Sing the Wondrous Story. Let's stand and sing this together. last visits that I enjoyed with Harold. I read from John 14, one of the passages that Gareth read for us earlier. After reading, I prayed for Harold, and when I said, Amen, Harold roused himself, and he started to pray for me. And this was something Harold did anytime I visited him, either 
at home or in hospital or at, at different periods when I'd be chatting to him. If I was ever in a place where I would be praying for him, he would always immediately then pray for me, for my wife, our children, and the ministry here at Great Vic. And I couldn't make out fully everything that he was saying behind the oxygen mask, but he definitely kept repeating the words from John 14 to my father's house. He must have said it about five or six times in the course of his prayer. In those last moments of Harold's earthly life, he was finding real hope in the truth that death for him as a Christian was no dead end, but instead it was a doorway that opened into his father's house. So I'd like to take a few moments in this address to reflect on the hope that was Harold's from John 14 and these verses where Jesus speaks of the Father's house. In John chapter 14, verse 1, we read these great words of comfort from Jesus that are so helpful for us to hear today. Let not your hearts be troubled. Isn't that amazing to think of those words in the face of death? Think of Harold's death. Oh, let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus spoke these words originally to his disciples who were anxious and grieving because Jesus had just shared with them that he was soon going to leave them. He was himself going to go through death. You can imagine for the disciples who had left everything for three years to follow Jesus, this news that Jesus was going away and was going to die must have been devastating for them. Their lives had been totally wrapped up in Jesus for the past three years. And so knowing that this news would have shaken their hearts, Jesus reassures them, let not your hearts be troubled. And then he says, you trust in God, trust also in me. You believe in God, believe also in me. These words from Jesus to his disciples in John 14 were spoken to move the disciples' hearts from a place of being troubled to a place where they were trusting. Jesus' remedy for a troubled heart is faith. And so I've just been reflecting on this today and through the week. Isn't it amazing that Joanne, to you and to your whole family, Jesus' words in the face of grief to you are, let not your hearts be troubled. And then Jesus proceeds to give the grounds for why their hearts don't have to be troubled. In a series of amazing statements, he tells them that his going away, his going through death, and all that it would ultimately involve is actually going to be for their good because his death was going to secure a place for them in his father's house. He explains that he was going to transform death so that it was no longer that dead end but the doorway to the father's house. And so in verse 2, Jesus explains this to the troubled disciples, saying, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Jesus reassures his troubled disciples, saying, look, my departure, my going away, my death is actually going to be for your good. I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. Now, I want to slow down for a moment and just observe carefully Jesus' words 
in verse 2, in my Father's house. It's interesting that in John 14, the word heaven is not used once. When Jesus speaks of what is beyond death for the Christian, in this chapter, he always refers to the place Christians go to after their earthly death as my father's house. And I love that. I think there's something so wonderful about that. This communicates warmth, hospitality, a warm welcome, not an abstract, foggy, white space of emptiness. Jesus says, in my father's house, there's plenty of space, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Second thing to observe, we need to think carefully about what Jesus meant when he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house. Is this a situation where the spare room's in a bit of a mess and Jesus is going to tidy it up before the disciples arrive? Well, certainly not. God's house is never in disorder. In Matthew 25, 34, we read that the kingdom has been prepared for the people of God from before the foundation of the earth. What is not prepared then that Jesus has to go and prepare? What is not prepared is the way to gain that room in the Father's house. Jesus is saying to his troubled disciples, my going away, my death is necessary to remove every obstacle to you getting to my Father's house. It's to remove every obstacle that stands in your way that would stop you from getting in to my Father's house. And elsewhere, Jesus stated so clearly that that obstacle is called sin. Jesus was explaining to the disciples that he was going to go through death. He was going to absorb the Father's wrath against sin. And he was going to die and defeat death, rising again from the grave and opening a way for people to be forgiven from their sins so that the obstacle of sin could be taken away and the doorway to the Father's house could be opened. Jesus was essentially saying, if I don't do this, if I don't die, the way remains closed. It is good for me to depart for this reason. Thirdly then, when we look closely at Jesus' language in this passage, we can't miss how he shifts the whole focus of life beyond death from a place to a person, that is to himself. Jesus says in verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Now, if you were reading that yourself, how would you expect it to read? You would expect it to read, I go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again to take you to that place. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and take you to myself. You see, here is the heart of Christianity. We are not just saved out of something, our sin and condemnation. We are saved into a beautiful relationship with Jesus Christ. Christianity is always relational. Jesus says, though I'm going away, disciples, and you're troubled about that, don't let your hearts be troubled because my going away is for your good. I'm going to go through death and I'm going to open up life for you. And I will come back for you 
And when I do, I'm going to take you to myself so that where I am, you can be also. In Psalm 23, that well-known psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, we read that when we pass through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to face evil. We don't have to fear evil. Why? Because the psalmist says, thou art with me. You are with me. When we die, for those who are in Jesus Christ, Jesus, our good shepherd, does not only shepherd us through our lives. He shepherds us through our death, takes us by the hand, says, let me lead you to the place I've prepared for you. Let me take you to myself and to take you on into the Father's house. And here's where I want to land this this afternoon. This is what has just happened to Harold Stewart. That's amazing. Shepherded through life and then coming into the fullness of Jesus saying, I'll come to you and I'll take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Heaven is the place where Jesus is. Jesus dwells with his Father. Heaven is being enfolded into the happy land of the triune God. Though this truth would have been wonderful and reassuring had the disciples fully understood it, we see in verses four to six that the disciples still didn't really get what Jesus was saying. In verse four, Jesus said to them, you know the place, uh, you know the way to where I'm going. And in verse five, Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answers in some of the most memorable words in all of Scripture. He says, I'm the way. Isn't that wonderful? How do we get to the Father's house? Jesus says, I'm the way. Not our way, the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is saying, I am going to prepare a place for you. And as I go through death, I become the way to get you there. I'm the truth that you hold on to to get there. And I'm the life, the eternal life that you will enjoy now and when you get there. Jesus is saying, when I say I go to prepare a place for you, I mean I open the way and I am the way. I confirm the truth and I am the truth. I purchase the life and I am the life. So Jesus says, not just to his grieving and anxious disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. He says to us all today, in the face of the death of Harold, that often reminds us of our own mortality when we're at funerals. We know one day it will be our turn and there will be a pastor speaking or someone speaking about our life and giving the hope of the gospel. Let not your hearts be troubled over death. I have gone through death, says Jesus, to prepare a place for you. I am the way to get you to that place. Here is the hope and comfort that Harold was reflecting on in the last hours of his earthly life. I'll never forget the moment when I finished praying for Harold, and this man, weak, having to keep an oxygen mask on because his oxygen's dropped so low, and every moment he kept taking it off, he said, oh, try and talk to me, and I'd say, no, Harold, keep it on. But I'll never forget when I said amen to my prayer, how this man, who seemed so weak, roused himself to strength, and he prayed, and I'm telling you, he prayed. 
as I said, I couldn't make it all out, but he, his fist was like this. He kept praying and praying about the Father's house, the Father's house, and I heard the word preeminence and glory, and I just kept my eyes open because I just thought, here is a privileged moment, a godly saint on the threshold of glory, rousing strength to pray and to speak of the hope that is his. There was no fear. privilege. So in light of this hope, today we, when we think about Harold's death, we don't have to let our hearts be troubled. And when we reflect on our own death, we don't have to have troubled hearts over that death if we have set our hope in Christ. Harold would want me to ask you, do you know Jesus? Do you know this hope for yourself? Have you put your hope in Jesus as not only the one who goes to prepare a place for you in the Father's house, but as the only one who can get you there? Because none of us can get ourselves there. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. I've turned death into a doorway. A doorway into my Father's house. The only way we can know that that door will open to the Father's house is if we have placed our hope in Jesus. When you die, what will your death be a doorway into? Let us together find hope in Jesus Christ and let us in that moment when our turn comes to die, let us find ourselves hoping in the comfort and the truth and the surety of the hope of our Father's house. Let's pray. Father, to hear Harold on the threshold of glory speaking of the Father's house was a moving experience that I will not forget. And Father, thank you for giving us the gift of Jesus, your Son, who has defeated death, and drawn the sting of sin out of death, and given us a hope beyond death. Father, thank you so much that today death is not a tragedy for Harold, but for him to die is gain. And Father, thank you that because of the gift of Jesus, that can be a reality for each of us. And so thank you today that this is a service of thanksgiving for his life, but above all, it's a service where we give thanks to you for saving Harold, for defeating death, for bringing light and immortality to life through the gospel. And so as we stand together again and respond to sing, Father, may we be able to sing from deep within our souls, knowing that in Christ it is well with my soul. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand together as we sing our closing hymn, When Peace Like a River Attendeth My Way.
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats. And can I just on behalf uh, of the whole Stuart family circle, uh, thank you all for coming. Please do stay for some refreshments if you're able to. Uh, the way we'll, we'll access those is as you make your way to the church building on the left-hand side or towards the back on the left-hand side, you'll collect your sandwiches, make your way around, get your cup of tea, and then find a place where you can enjoy it. Thank you all very much for coming.